welcome everybody to this week's episode of Doing It With Styles. If you guys have been in the studio or you know me at all, you know what a huge Star Trek fan I am. And I ran into this gentleman right here, Mr. Robert Picardo, who is one of the greatest Star Trek performers because he is a hologram. Please state the nature of the not flattering enough emergency. Okay. No, that's very kind. I'll work harder. I'll no, work no, harder. it's very good. Thank you. Uh, we're here at uh, Days of the Dead Con in Vegas. Although I'm mostly known from science fiction, I have right. been in a classic horror a film known as The Howling. So I'm here under my um, on, under my scary uh, werewolf guys. And and you're doing a fine job. And I and I. I just, I cannot thank you enough for agreeing to do this interview. My I mean, pleasure. Uh, it's, it's for us fans, when we interact with those people that we see on TV and in the movies that we really admire, when they turn out to be nice people, it's just that much more rewarding. Well, that's very kind. I am going to rip your throat out at the end of the interview. Oh, though. please do, yes. Because you expect it. I mean, I said hey, I'm listen, in my scary guys. I would guys. expect nothing less. All right. Now, of course, then I can, if I flip over in, immediately into my Star Trek persona, I can heal you immediately after. That's, what a, what a nice balance there right. that you have there created. You I can, I can. Do you, do you have a favorite role or ah. one that you, that you just loved playing or, or? Well, I've been very blessed in my career. Uh, before Star Trek, I was on a wonderful Vietnam drama called China Beach. I remember that with Dana, Dana Delaney. Delaney. You know, oh, everyone's heartthrob. I was so, and and as a Vietnam vet myself, I love that show. Well, thank so. you, thank you, first of all, for your service. I'm thank I'm you. glad it was a very uh, con contentious, divisive war, as you know, it here yes. in this country. And uh, uh, I think for the first time in our history, we made the mistake of blaming those who served in the war right. rather than the policies that got us and kept us in the war. Um, so I think that your generation of, of people in the service were never, never got the thanks of a grateful nation that you deserve. Thank you. And I think that uh, that China Beach, in some small way, helped heal. I think some of those wounds. Uh, well, I, I have to tell you. And excuse me for interrupting, but I got to tell you this: is that one of the things that helped me cope when I got back was Star Trek. Because my head was pretty messed up. And um, seeing the vision of what we could be and the future uh, gave me hope and helped me get through some tough times. So that's for that, I thank you. And that's why I've always, I mean, I've probably seen them all. That's great to hear. Star Trek is uh, perennially treasured, I think, for its optimistic vision of humanity's future in space, a, a future where science and technology can empower us without destroying us. Yes. And, uh, and it's also a future in which each individual is valued for the content of their character, not for the way they look, where everyone works together in harmony toward a common goal, and really where the goal is just to learn and understand rather than, you know, to find cheaper, you know, rare minerals to make, make cheaper batteries. We're out exploring just to understand our place in the cosmos more. So I don't think when I was a young man, I really understood why Star Trek is so valuable to, right. to so many people. But now that I've been on the inside of it for almost 30 years, I certainly do. And, and we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the premiere of Voyager in I January just, of next year. And, and it was each new iteration of Star Trek that came out was just fascinating for me and when the first movie came out uh, you know after that long gap it was like seeing old friends again and and did you did you realize what you were getting into when you took that role i kind of dimly understood it you uh you you become a a, a, a over an overnight um recognizable face if your career hasn't gotten you to that point prior to that Suddenly, you've got a dedicated fan base around the globe that that are anxious to learn about you, to watch the new show. Uh, every Star Trek, it seems, takes two or three years to finally hit its stride. And of course, as an actor, it does change your life. For the rest of your life, you are known to that international fan base, and and the work 
uh, lives on. It's evergreen in the sense that people continue to watch it over and over again. I meet, I'll meet a 10-year-old fan who's just watched 176 hours of Voyager, <laughs> and it's brand new to that yes. young man or woman. Yeah. And, uh, and that makes you feel good about having a, a legacy in a popular entertainment that promotes high ethical and, and, and moral standards that promotes you know exploration science technology and most of all positivity about our future and and the writing was so great the character development and and to see each one of the characters develop as the you know as the the show went on was so much fun and, and my character starting as a blank slate he was a new piece of technology who had uh, supposedly the capacity to develop a bedside manner so that he had what were called emotional algorithms so that um, in each doctor-patient interaction he would grow and learn and become more human-like. So that was a wonderful journey to start with kind of no personality at all, no emotional affect, and over the course of seven years to develop into a very human-like artificial intelligence and now that we've reached the moment in time yeah the year 2023 i call the the year of artificial intelligence anxiety all of the all of the stories that we posited on voyager in the mid 1990s about how artificial intelligence designed to service but what if someone could hijack the core programming flip that switch change the doctors core programming away from the Hippocratic Oath and to do no harm and just flip the switch and make him a killer. It's theoretically possible. And yeah, we, we did just, we did enough of those eye. those evil other episodes were the ones that really raised some of those uh, those fears that we now have about artificial intelligence. How much how much how much did you have in developing that character? Did you have did they allow you some input? And I, I would say that the uh, the, the Star Trek uh, writers. Well, first of all, the writer producers cast the show well, and then they write to the strengths of the actor. Uh, early on, they liked my comic abilities. Yes. So they. And, a, and, a lot of people don't realize that about you, mm -hmm. but you do have a pretty good sense <laughs> of humor. Thank you. So they wrote. I mean, look, he agreed to do this interview with me. Exactly. <laughs> Who the heck is this guy? He said, uh, is styles, going yes. going in styles. If you're going to do it, do it with styles. Do it with styles. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. Um, I would say that I made a lot of suggestions to the writers. Uh, many of them they took, many they didn't. But but some of my, uh, uh, you know, the fact that I that I'm an opera fan on the show is my suggestion. Although I never intended to sing, I just wanted to listen to it. So they took it beyond my original suggestion, uh, which and, was pretty cool. And also some of my other relationships. My relationship with Seven of Nine, in which I am teaching her how to reclaim our humanity having been assimilated by the Borg. And the irony in uh, that. Exactly. That, of that, a hologram. Exactly. You got the joke. The yeah. joke is that my character was so full of himself and had such a high opinion of himself, he thought he was a better teacher of how to be human than a human. <laughs> and that there had lots of comic possibilities. Yeah. And even romantic ones, when my character is teaching her how to behave on a date and sort of falls in love with her. So I really treasure those seven years. I love my castmates, uh, with our 30th anniversary next year, we will be together, I'm sure, at multiple events, including the 2025 Star Trek Cruise, which are lots of fun. We'll have uh, all, uh, I believe, our entire cast, along with 3,500 Star Trek fans, wow. trapped at sea. <laughs> so I hope, uh, I, I, I know it'll be fun. I've been on a number of the cruises, and my uh, castmates that haven't been on a cruise before, I will... Uh, I will defuse their anxiety. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> indoctrinated. Well, I, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. I, I it, it's one of the highlights of my life, and I don't mean no. that. It's very and, kind. I mean, uh, thank so, you, thank you very much. My pleasure, sir. And, and thanks to all of your watchers. Uh, uh, thanks for being Star Trek fans. There are new shows being made all the time, so and check them out. It, yeah. It, yes. And there's even great. there's one in preparation called. Starfleet Academy, Academy I've heard I can't of. wait for that. And then, uh, and then also, uh, I will be on season two of Star Trek Prodigy 
uh, voicing uh, uh, an animated version of my character who's pretty cute. I wouldn't mind being an animated version of my character now. <laughs> okay. Anyway, EMH, out. Like I said, if you're going to do it, do it with styles. Thanks, everybody.